addressing the full body. Public speakers will not engage in conversations with the chair or council members. And all members of the committee staff and the public are expected to refrain from abusive language. Uh, failure to comply with the code of conduct, which will disturb, disrupt, or impede the orderly conduct of this meeting, will result in removal from the meeting. Uh, this meeting of the Neighborhood Services and Education Committee will now come to order. Can I ask the clerk to please call roll? Candelas? Here. Torres? Duan? Here. Ortiz? Present. And Davis? Thank you. Awesome. I do not believe we have a consent uh, calendar, so let's move towards the regular agenda. Uh, item D1, Citywide Sustainable Park Maintenance Report. And I believe there's a staff presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair, members of the committee. I'm Avi Otam, Deputy Director of Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood Services, joined today by Tori O'Reilly, Division Manager for Parks Maintenance and Infrastructure, Jeff Gomez, Parks Manager, and Raul Ramirez, Gardener in Park District 5, who has been in his job for about nine months, taking care of several downtown parks, including Guadalupe River Park and Gardens and the trail there. We are here today to present our annual report on sustainable park maintenance, including current park condition assessment scores. I'll turn it over to Ruhl to get us started. Thank you, Avi. Hello, my name is Raul Ramirez, and I am a gardener in the Park District 5. As a gardener, I am the lead for maintaining parks in downtown San Jose, including the Heritage Rose Garden and the Guadalupe River Trail. But I have worked across the city, and I know firsthand that San Jose has a park for everyone. These parks include regional parks like Alum Rock, Lake Cunningham, and Emma Proust Farm Park, neighborhood parks like Plato Royal and, Al and Bacasto, specialized parks like ja the Japanese Friendship Garden and the Municipal Rose Garden. Within all the parks, there are opportunities for active and passive recreation for just about everyone. Next slide, please. Keeping parks safe, clean, and available is the mission and day-to-day -day occupations of park park maintenance employees like me. To guide us, the department has established maintenance standards and completes yearly assessments to measure where we're meeting in them. Resource allocation decisions are made based on assessment scores and equity indicators, including the California Healthy Place Index, Heat Island Index, and Tree Equity Scores. Next slide, please. Maintaining parks is, huge, is a huge undertaking. Some of our neighboring cities have a dozen or a few dozen parks. We have 212 in our inventory to care for. To do this, we use a wraparound strategy, including daily park maintenance, specialized teams, resilience corps, volunteers, and contractors who each bring unique talents and energy to the equation. Jeff will now share how we and our partners are doing. Thank you, Roel. Um, I'm Jeff Gomez, Parks Manager for PRNS. In my role, I oversee Region 3, which consists of Council Districts 3, 4, 5, and 6, and the Centralized Mowing and IPM Turf Team. This year, we're pleased to report a citywide average PCA score of 88%, up from 85% the previous year. The chart on the screen shows the percent of developed park acres by park condition assessment score. The outline shows the percent of developed acres that scored 80% or above on the assessment. The increase from 2022 can be explained by an increase in scores overall, and especially in some of our larger parks. Next slide, please. To complement staff's evaluation of the condition of parks, we seek the community's input. We had a public survey that was promoted through council offices and neighborhood groups. We also gathered feedback from residents at three Viva Calle events. In addition to getting feedback, this also presents engagement opportunities with community members. Results show that what the public may see as high or low condition may not always be in line with what the staff sees. The differences are thought provoking and will be considered as part of future changes in park maintenance standards. Next slide, please. The Healthy Places Index is compromised of different social conditions that drive health. The higher the score, the more favorable the social conditions when compared to the other census tracts in San Jose. This chart shows that staff has made progress towards our goal of consistent park conditions across neighborhoods as the band of scores is narrowing. 
Parks are prioritized for focusing both PCA and HPI scores. The PCA scores tell us what needs to improve and the HPI scores tell us where to start. Tori will share some examples of how we did that in the past year. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm Tori O'Reilly, Division Manager for Parks Maintenance and Infrastructure. Being responsible for the conditions of over 200 parks, I'm incredibly proud of the intentionality and dedication our team has demonstrated this last year in preparing work plans and executing projects, especially where they are needed the most. Parks displaying lower PCA scores in areas characterized by lower HPI percentiles receive heightened attention from staff unless urgent health and safety concerns require immediate intervention in other areas. Successes using this method are illustrated on this slide. Overall, park condition improvements in those areas characterized by low HPI percentiles, percentiles are a testament to the strategies we have implemented and our progress in filling the ranks with new staff. Next slide, please. We spoke last year on staffing issues impacting morale and the ability to keep up with maintenance. In 2022-2023, 67 vacancies were filled in all levels of park maintenance. Excuse me. Through, though many positions were filled internally, leaving additional vacancies, the department had a flat, fresh influx of new employees coming from our Resilience Corps internship program. In 2022-2023, 44 participants joined park districts as interns. In the summer of 2023, a full-time and part-time maintenance assistance recruitment was held, where nine members of the Resilience Corps were hired into full-time positions, and 17 were offered part-time. We're currently in the process of promoting some more into full-time positions and hiring about 18 more into part-time positions, which will often lead to full-time. This pipeline is truly delivering. Even fully staffed, the department is often under-resourced to maintain parks at the desired level. To address this, the Volunteer Management Unit and the Resilience Corps have been built into our Park District PCA Improvement Work Plans. Next slide, please. Okay, in addition to the resource opportunities we spoke of on the previous slide, we are moving forward with strategies to further improve the product we provide. The picture on the left is an irrigation clock. We continue to move forward with installing systems that can be programmed and operated remotely. The systems also have flow meters which detect leaks resulting in overall reduction of water with no impact to the park. In addition, we are currently updating trail maintenance standards and plan on resuming our trail PCAs by 2025. We are also supporting San Jose Conservation Corps in an effort to receive a grant which would allow for our current trail safety team to be expanded to additional trails. Next slide, please. We want to thank you for the opportunity to present our annual um, park maintenance report to you and I ask that you accept the report and we are available for questions Thank you, I uh, really appreciate um, That report and nice to meet you Raul. Great job um, If we can please open up for public comment We have no public comment for this item back to the committee. All right. Thank you so much Let me just get my All right, uh, first we have Councilmember Candelas. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, no, I, I wanted to start off by thanking staff uh, for your work on this. This is, this is something that I, I know my office um, uh, reaches out to, you, to your department a lot uh, with regards to maintenance requests and questions about 
uh, the conditions of, of certain parks in my council district. Um, so appreciate your work and, and the, your dedication to our community to make sure that we have nice parks. Um, that being said, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of work to do. Um, and um, I, I think we can strive for better. I, I, I got a question on the PCAs. What could we attribute a 20-point uh, drop uh, in PCAs from one year to the other? I would have to say I have to look at that PCA and see you know which amenities in the park. Um, the PCA is a point in time report, and so you know if you were at a park, Fowler Creek's a good one in your district. You know, one year I did a PCA at, at Fowler Creek on July 5th, and it failed on litter and garbage, and it failed on a bunch of other things. So, you know, it's really what's going on. So when we see something like that, we drill down into the details. And, you know, in each of the categories for the PCAs, we rate on multiple items. Like turf, I think there's five or six different ratings. So we go, okay, what's failing here? And we go through and we do that and we try and correct what that is. So without knowing something specific. No, no, I appreciate that. I was speaking more broadly um, across across the uh, across the, the city. And and while I appreciate those point point in times, it is a snapshot. Is there anything we're doing to capture more holistically for year round conditions and average, considering we have multiple touch points with our staff, um, our, our our groundwork staff, and our, our the staff that we contract with um, to to, are, are, is there any thinking around that for how we can incorporate that into the PCA average so it's not a single snapshot in time because you know a big a big barbecue can throw our school or 20 points that that sounds uh, 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 the methodology behind that it sounds a little um, flawed so I believe when we were here last year we talked about how we were instituting monthly park condition assessments that the supervisors would do on each of their parks so we're almost a year into doing that and we're, we're fine-tuning the process to make sure we hit all parks on a regular basis but once we fix that process and you know we're confident in the scores I think that we can probably integrate that into the annual park condition assessment as well okay so 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 we are so there's multiple to, rather than a point in time so let me re, let me rephrase that my initial question is um, that being said, of, of uh, you know, the, the, the park condition being a, a, a macro level view of, of the conditions of the parks, um, generally speaking across um, all our parks, what is generally the thing that we hear? Is it turf? Is it, is it issues around how much we're watering? Is it issues around the conditions of the actual amenities, the playgrounds, the, the, the resilient surface that we took a year to replace a, on a slide in one of my dis, in one of my parks. What what exactly like general thirty thousand foot level? It doesn't have to be. I, I, that's why I'm not asking you specifically about a park in my district because I don't want to do that to you. I don't think that's very fair. But I'm but globally. I would say overall, turf is what brings our scores down the most. You know, and that consists of um, you know irrigation issues with turf. So there's brown spots because much of our irrigation infrastructure is beyond its lifetime. In addition to that, rodent issues at parks, um, you know, weeds in the grass, and so we measure each of those, and in a lot of the turf, they'll fail multiple categories, and so the turf overall will fail. Gotcha, okay, all right. And, and so the, the VMU unit you mentioned in the presentation, the volunteer management unit, is, is something that we're doing to augment our, not just our workforce, but the actual uh, number the, the 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 amount that we need to actually invest in our parks correct so how how is the volunteer management unit identifying parks um, in in our city and how are they rolling those out so the volunteer management unit this past year we did something differently so they now are utilizing the HPI and the PCA scores and so we look at the PCA scores you know that are low in the lower HPI areas and we say okay what's a project that can be handled by volunteers you know and once we find a project that's something we'll schedule a project day on we're also um, working in those communities we're working closely with Project Hope to try and work with neighborhood associations to adopt those parks so we have more eyes on it and more ongoing maintenance from volunteers um, and how far out are we in, uh, are we planning for these the VMU uh, uh, project days? 
So the actual scheduling is usually two to three months out that we oh. plan. Um, the concept that they're going to work on, you know, a certain task in a park is done when we create the work plan based on the PCA scores. Great. Now that that's that's there has to be methodology behind why which parks we go to and why we go to them. I completely understand that. But now here's here's my my uh, my issue. My issue is getting told week of of activations at for example Lake Cunningham that's happened this this Sunday, um, and so our VMU unit. Um, uh, you know, is doing a great job, but I, I feel like the coordination between our offices um, and identifying those project days needs to be tighter um, because uh, we're losing opportunities to mobile, mobilize volunteers, um, utilizing the you know the the offices, my council office specifically, um, and and so it's my hope that going forward in the next year that our VMU unit um, is is vol is recruiting volunteers and doing. Uh, you know these these activations to get our community involved because I hear it all the time from our residents saying, "Hey, our parks need a lot of work. We need we need cleaner parks. We need to invest in our parks." Um, and then our VMU unit sends me an email on Tuesday, tells my staff, "Hey, this Sunday we're going to be at X Park." Okay, great. How am I going to mobilize 100 to 150 people that you're expecting uh, in a few days? Which is it shouldn't just rest on my office. But but do do you see that you see you see my issue? Council member, that it's great feedback, and um, absolutely, that's how it should work. Uh, and we're taking notes and, and owning that uh, that issue that just played out. Uh, I will just acknowledge our VMU team has gone through tremendous change. So many of these things that we think of as absolutely routine things are being learned in real time. So uh, absolutely, we'll we'll, t we'll uh, give good coaching and support to the team member who's going through this, and as so he can he and he or she can plan better for future events, but point very well taken. Great. No, and if this was the first time, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be saying it, but this is multiple times. This is uh, at least the third or fourth time that, that I've had this experience. And so um, it's just a, a lack, it's just a frustration that, that we're feeling based on feedback that I'm getting from my residents based on the conditions of our parks. This is an opportunity to uplift and empower our community by taking, you know, the beautification efforts in hand. And, you know, I've taken the lead on plenty of these, and I know there's a lot of work that goes into uh, staff time in mobilizing and coordinating this. So I don't want to lose that opportunity that we have as a city to be able to mobilize and, and engage residents on an issue that I know is happening in, in, in our city. So, um, uh, you know, that, that being said, I'll, I'll move acceptance of, this, of the staff report um, and uh, end my questions. I'll second. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, staff, for the report. Now, I, what is the vacancy rate in um, in your department at this point to to fill? I believe within parks maintenance right now, it's about fifteen percent. Our goal is to hit ten percent or less. Well, that's good news. Uh, we're moving um, toward the right direction. Now, with this influx of a uh, bunch of new city employees, how do you go about to train them or guide them towards their, their new position in order to be efficient in, in, in taking care of our parks? Each employee that comes in, we have a 30, 60, 90 day plan that their supervisor works with them on. Um, we go over the different job competencies and you know look at what does success look like in this. We review park maintenance standards, so the staff. And then a lot of it comes from you know employees like Raul. Raul's the gardener, and so he has um, maintenance assistant, which is our first step into the city, and then grounds worker, which is the next step up. They work directly underneath his supervision, and so he shows them a ro shows them the ropes and you know, it teaches them how to do the work and the level it should be done at. And then on your um, presentation, the, the HPI score, can you elaborate on that a little bit, the, the Health Place Index? Sure, the Healthy Places Index is an indicator of life expectancy at birth, and it uses, utilizes 25 different um, characteristics and you know, like employ what's the employment in the neighborhood? What's the accessibility to fresh, you know, fruits and vegetables? Is there clean air? Is there clean water? 
Um, is there health care available? What's the transportation situation? So items like that, and they use it to determine what the average life expectancy in the community at birth is. And so the lower the score, the more resources we need to direct towards a neighborhood where the higher the score, you know, generally doesn't need as much help. So um, it's, and it's a nationwide, it's, you know, redone every three years. Um, demographics do change, so the HPI scores do change. I think that was noted in the memo. Um, but we find that it's a pretty accurate indicator of the areas of San Jose that need additional resources. So in District 3, 5, and 7, <clears throat> the score is awfully low. And then how do you distribute, you know, the support uh, based on this information? So um, as Jeff mentioned in the presentation, we take into consideration the park condition assessment scores and then um, what the Healthy Places Index score of that area where that park is located is. So that's how we prioritize the items. And then on page number eight, you know, we, we, we see some of these uh, PCA score is like at 6%, 4%. Why is it such a low PCA? On page number eight, success with equity decision making. So looking at, at that, uh, that column, what we're trying to highlight is the amount of improvement from one year to the next. So in some cases, the improvement uh, was, as you noted, only four or 6%, and, and in other, for other parks, it, the improvement from one year to the next was as high as 37%. So you know, not every park saw a transformational change. Some did, which is terrific, and some was a little bit more uh, iterative improvements. Uh, it, it really depends, as Tori's mentioned, on the details of, of what the park had failed in the park condition assessments in the prior year as we use those specific standards that haven't been met to drive our work plans to move forward. You know, I, and we're, we're constantly talking about fair and equitable, and, and I drive all over the city, and, and I try to look at parks and buildings and so on, especially at parks and so on. And again, District 3, 5, and, and 7, especially 5 and 7, uh, and when we're talking about putting more resources, I don't see it. The residents complaining, especially the underserved community, those are areas that tie the community to our city, to their health, to the vitality in this environment that we have, which extremely stressful, why aren't we put the, the effort in, in those underserved community when I know that other district parks are taken care of? Why, why isn't five and seven as emphasized and putting the money and the resource? I can't really speak to the money because we're allotted, you know, budgetarily a certain amount of money but we have reallocated resources this past year, you know, based on the HPI and the park condition assessment scores. We, we know this information has been around for a long time. It, it, wasn't, it didn't happen last year, right? And it didn't happen the year before, five or 10 years ago. We know that District 5 and 7 parks have been neglect and we know that we encumber quite a bit of unhoused residents on top of that. Why didn't we put the resource and plan it out years ahead, right? I mean, we're talking about just last year you put more resource. Now, even though you put the resource this year, we won't see the, the fruition of the condition of the park until two or three years from now. And then we'll go round in circle again what, what is the ultimate plan that not only resource funding with implementation and result, so that way I can answer to my community, I can answer to D5 community that 
we're doing something. We're, we're actually saying what we're going to do. We're going to go, re, you know, put the resource and the finance to, to make it better. Because I'll tell you this, every citizen in this city is equal. And we should treat them like they're equal. And so I'm tired just driving around. I've seen some incredible parks out there, right? Almaden Lake and so many more. And then, you know, in my district, in District 5, even in Lake Cunningham, right? And, and, and Lake Cunningham is a bigger problem than we can solve at this point, but we can always take a, you know, one step at a time. So I, I don't know how to say it, but we need to see result. We need to see the implementation so that way our citizen can be proud and can see that their tax money is put into good work. And I'm not saying that PRNS is not doing so. I'm saying is how do we relocate the resource, relocate the finance to area that is needed? I mean, they don't have any problem over the, the you know, um, the Rose Garden, right? So <laughs> these are things that I, it, it hurts me. It hurts m our community and, and, and I, I'm looking for an answer. And, and I think you guys have the answer and we, we're looking forward to some type of result. Thank, thank you, Council Member, for, for, your, for your point and uh, point well taken. Uh, you speak to some uh, underlying challenges that I think we know as staff, but it's, it's good to, to reiterate them that uh, although day-to-day -day maintenance, we have some flexibility in how we deploy them. And as Tori mentioned, we are making those deployment decisions using the equity lens. There are underlying systems that dictate how key resources like capital projects that can come in and really uh, completely renovate a park. Those funds and how they are distributed uh, is driven by systems that don't necessarily or don't use those same equity lenses. So I think that's where we run into some serious obstacles where a council district like yours, like District 7, has very little, very minimal capital dollars available where our park or multiple parks could be transformed, which would then also make the job of daily maintenance a lot easier because what we struggle with oftentimes is parks that are aging, uh, have deferred backlogs of maintenance, and we're just trying our best to keep up, but we don't have that ability, the capital dollars to come in and really catch up. Have you thought about collaborating with private industry, you know, public, public and, and, and private conservancy to get the funding and the help that we need on some of these parks. And I'm running out of time. I'll be quick then. Council Member Dohan, a great, great question. Yes, we, we do look for those opportunities uh, in different parks. Conservancies aren't always available in every, for every park, but for example, there is one that's been discussed for the Kelly Park chain. So we, we've been engaged with that partner to think about what that model could look like. Uh, but that, that is a great resource. We do look for corporate partners whether it's through volunteerism or direct donations in some cases that can help fund and spur some improvements. Thank you very much. Almost raised my hand to talk, but then I'm chairing the meeting, so never mind. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you both for your comments, and I really, really appreciate um, the in, in, intentionality that we're bringing to these conversations because it is the reality of these council members that happen to be on this committee that um, a lot of our parks just aren't acceptable. Uh, uh, this, the standard of, of parks that we're presenting to the community just isn't, isn't there. Um, but it's, it's, it's no secret that maintenance of the parks has been top of mind for me and, and my office as we've been meeting heavily about that. And I'm dedicated to ensuring that our residents have access to beautiful, clean, and safe spaces for recreation. And I, I first off just want to thank PRNS staff for the report and for the great work that you have been taking, uh, that you've been doing to ensure that our park conditional assessment scores, the reflection of the quality uh, of our parks are up to, up to standard. Um, I understand that it is tough work. You know, nobody here is saying it's easy. Um, and I'm certain that the weather has also been challenging for you and, and for the quality of our parks uh, most recently. You know, I think the reason why I, I personally value and I'm, I'm tough also on the maintenance of our parks is because for many residents, especially those on the east side um, where many of our homes are overcrowded, multiple families living in, in one home, their local park is the only place for recreation and for them to get physical activity in. 
You know, many of us have birthdays there, celebrations. Um, personally, my favorite childhood memories have been in, in District 5 parks, be it playing basketball at Cimarron or hiking in Alum Rock when it was a District 5 park. But our, our, our parks are vital for our working class families here in the, in the city of San Jose. And as I read the report, um, I wanted to share a concern in my interpretation. The department uses the PCA score as a type of mark for standards and, and performance, which is appreciated as it gives a snapshot, only a snapshot as Councilmember uh, Candelis mentioned, uh, of the park against a rubric uh, of metric. To that end, a PCA score is simply that, a metric, and I, I don't believe that it truly reflects the perception of the day-to-day -day park users in, in, our, in our district. I understand there was a citywide survey completed to gather public opinion, and, and I wanted to know if the survey collected demographic information like zip code or neighborhood so that we could differentiate between what regions think about their uh, personal parks. I believe it did. I don't have that information in front of me, but I do believe it did. Okay. Is there any way we could get access to that? Sure. Great. We'd love to you know, look at the data and try to get a, a handle of public opinion. You know, my office, just like my colleagues, take in a lot of park concerns and comments from residents, sharing that the quality of the trail of parks is needing attention. You know? So I, I wanted to see if that survey was reflective of the, all the different areas of the city. To my earlier point, the PCA score is being a snapshot can you help me understand, for, for example, in, in, my, in my district, a park like Emma Pruch? It scored 96% in both 2022 and 2023 when the entire playground was out of commission due to construction. Um, is there a reason why the construction or the, the, um, the, the, the playground being inaccessible didn't impact the, the PCA score? I would have to go back and look. Um, my guess is it may not have been rated because it wasn't available, but mm -hmm. I'd have to look at the score. Okay, And Thank I you. can do that and get back to you. Thank you, okay. Thank you for that understanding. Moving along, a lot of my parks have missing playground pieces. You know, we put in that order for a piece when I first took office. We're still waiting for that piece in Mayfair. You go to um, Cassell Park and the whole ship that used to be there is removed and you know I don't even want to get into what um, the overfall gardens looks like because that's to me personally the, the state of that is an insult to our, our Chinese community here in the city of San Jose. Um, can you please describe the relationships between playground manufacturers and, and our department and why we're having to wait you know close to a year for pieces for parks to come in? I can speak to the, the weight. Um, you know, each manufacturer is different. Sometimes it's the shipping time. Some of the parts have to come from overseas. Some of the parts actually have to be um, like recreated. You know, they're not just that so you can pull it out of a box. But once again, I can get you more information on that. No, appreciate that. So for our large contracts, maybe items with, with warranties, um, is there any sort of uh, agreement being made with our, our contractors um, or providers um, for potential replacement pieces so we don't have to wait a long time um, for essential um, components of the playgrounds? Not that I'm aware of, but I can speak with our capital division and look into that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, you know, I wanted to just, you know, you, you guys mentioned to Council Member Dewan, you know, who's hammering and it's, you know, I know that my predecessor was always frustrated with the state of parks in District 5 and, and District 7. I mean, you know, I am starting, I am that way and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to work with, with everyone, but, you know, it's getting frustrating as well. But like, when you, when you tell us, you know, he said, how, how come our parks look this certain way and other parks in the city, you know, he said certain parks on the west side look that way. And pretty much you guys said, well, the way the system works, um, that's how funding is, is um, provided. Well, then maybe it's time to change the system. Maybe it's time to look at system change in, in this city 
um, to make sure that you know families in the eastern port part of the city um, get get the quality resources that families in other regions do. So I just wanted to make sure I responded to that. But I, as I wrap up, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention how excited I am for the Emma Pruch Farm Park all-inclusive playground, which is set to come online by March, hopefully if the, the weather permits. Um, I, I truly believe that's gonna be a asset that will serve our East San Jose community and every single child due to it being all-inclusive. Um, so I'm really hope, I'm hoping that um, everyone can come. We're gonna be doing a ribbon cutting, so we'll be sure to share that. But I, I'm, I'm hoping that um, once we get that, uh, we can make sure we share it with the entire city because it's, it's gonna be a real, uh, a real treat for all the families. Um, and then I believe I have my colleague, Council Member Torres, who's raised his hand. Good afternoon. I apologize for coming in late. I had a VTA BART ad hoc committee right before this, so I do apologize for, for missing the presentation. However, I'm not gonna dig too much into, uh, into, the, into the weeds of our parks. No pun intended, of course. Um, but there's, there's, three, there's three, very, uh, three questions that, that, I, that I think that need to be asked. And we continue to hear in closed session, but I can't say it because it's, it's in uh, closed session, but I'm, I, I think hopefully Angel could, could say it. I think it's time in the city of San Jose that we have a park bond. I think many of us on this, on this dais know that, our community knows that, and it's been well over Angel, 25 years since we had a, uh, the last park bond, right? Can you let our community know how or why our city doesn't push, aggressively push for another park bond to happen? Because I know that they tell us in, in, you know, in private meetings and in, in, in closed session, but if possible, can you let us know why our city doesn't aggressively pursue a, a park bond? Council Member, uh, Angel Rios, Deputy City Manager. Let, let, let me let me take that. Uh, and, and before I answer that question, <clears throat> let, let, let me ask. Let, let me answer kind of the 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 kind of the underlying question. The bottom line is our park maintenance staffing model right now is grossly under resourced. So the bottom line is everything that the department is doing right now is really a stopgap measure to do the best we can with the resources that we have. And I think the results that we're seeing is a direct uh, result of that, right? Um, I mean, we, we could try to, you know, hone in on PCA scores. We could try to kind of shift, you know, one or two people here and there. But the bottom line is, is the volume is out of control. I would say, uh, back of the envelope math here, we, when you look at staff ratio, you, you're looking at one to two employees per park, right? We have over 200 parks, 13 regional parks. Uh, uh, back years back when I was parks director we had never fully recovered from the 50% reduction of park maintenance staff that we received and so right now I think we're, we're, we're kind of reaping what we've put into our park system having said that I still think we, we should always still find ways to kind of streamline to get more uh, more efficient and there is absolutely no excuse for a, a park in one area to look nicer than a, than a park in another area, especially if we're talking, you know, any comparisons around West Side or East Side or anything like that. So there's, you know, there's there's never an excuse for that. But I, I do think we have a systemic issue in terms of your question regarding a bond. So we we were actively pursuing a bond because you are absolutely right. Our last bond was in was in 2000 Measure P, and and it really uh, provided a, a lot of opportunity to in that in that time really to create a lot of community centers, right? and park improvements at, the, at that, at, during that era. Um, when we started pursuing uh, the polling, uh, it just wasn't polling, just given the, the kind of the, the situation around the electorate and, and, and how polling results were coming in, the, the highest ranking we got uh, in terms of polling during that time was, was programs that would prevent gangs. That's the closest that we got in terms of anything that could get us to a two-thirds two uh, uh, vote which is what we would need to, to really to really do this um, I do think it's something that we need to explore again right we are uh, without getting into a whole lot of details right now we are 
doing some preliminary polling to that end because we definitely see that the only course correction to this problem is to one, resource it appropriately, and then two, uh, uh, Councilmember Ortiz made reference to this, I think we also have to reassess and reevaluate our structure, the way we, we, we deploy and structure staffing. And thirdly, it's really how we deal with PDO uh, in the collection of PDO funds. Right now, that model is based on collecting capital funds with new construction. While in some of these older uh, communities such as Eastside, District 3, District 5, District 7, you're not gonna have a lot of new construction, so you're gonna have little or no capital funds, PDO money. You go to North San Jose, you're gonna have a lot. You're gonna go to certain parts downtown. of uh, you know, nor northern downtown, you're gonna have a lot. Uh, we, we need to fix that, and that's a policy issue that we need to fix because right now that restricts money that goes specifically to new neighborhoods, right? So we have some systemic issues that we need to fix, but, uh, but to your point, we definitely need to explore. Right now, going to the voters with uh, tax measure is a challenge, but it's something that we need to explore. And for a, a bond to pass, it's 55% or, well, or two thirds? Well, it, it depends on the type of bond. We, we're looking at, 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 at different, you know, there's a general, there, there's a general, and then there's also one that, you know, it, it gets a little complicated in that there, there's the, the type that we're trying to go after was one that would allow us to put money into operational funding because back in the past, the bonds that were passed were strictly capital. Well, right now, if you take a look at the issues that everybody has raised here, these are operational issues, maintenance. right? And so we need to, because at one point, we received city and state funding to fully fund maintenance at the city. That no longer is the case. And so uh, we have to go after a funding mechanism that will allow us to uh, generate money that would allow us to put money directly into operations. Okay, and, 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 and Uncle, you, you did bring up park impact fees. So I think we all know on this dais and in our community that, that park impact fees help build parks, but they do not maintain parks, mm -hmm. right? And, and this is why we see mm -hmm. some parks looking better than others, unfortunately, right? Correct. Especially in our most underserved neighborhoods, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're just the lack of quality of our parks is not there compared to other areas in the west side, unfortunately, right? So, so the park, so park impact fees, you just mentioned it a little bit, is, is that direction from, from us? Mm -hmm. to, does one of us have to go to the, uh, to the rules memo and you know, say, hey, we need, to ch we need to change how park impact fees are utilized or spent in our city of San Jose? Mm -hmm. So yes, we're building more parks in downtown San Jose, but now we need to build more parks in District 5 or District 7. Because mm -hmm. I, I had three park openings <laughs> last year because of, because of the, all the condos and office towers that are coming into mm -hmm. da downtown, we right? Saw. And yeah, mm -hmm. and, 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 and let's, let's be frank, I know I'm council member for downtown, but I have family in the east side, I have family mm -hmm. in, in, in Meadow Fair, I have, and mm -hmm. I have family in other parts of our city that are under-resourced where you know, they're, they're not happy to go to the mm -hmm. park because it's not well-maintained. Mm -hmm. So is that direction from us, Angel? Yeah, so, so let, let, let me start off with it. I'll turn it over to Avi. So there's two things that work here. You know, we, we have state, state policy and state regulation that we have to adhere to, but how we implement that state policy really is that at the, at the council does have quite a bit of discretion as long as it's in alignment with that overall state policy. Now, what the department is doing right now is actually reassessing the whole PDO, PIO with this problem in mind because the, 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 the model that we've used in the past is, is not really helping us, right? So what you're gonna be seeing is the staff come back with an assessment and some recommendations on how we should go forward with a different distribution of resources based on PDO and PIO. So that, that is on, 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 the, on the work plan. Uh, Avi, I don't know if you wanna add anything else to that. You said it all. Okay. Uh, because we, we are trying to fix that. Th that's a systemic problem in this, in this structure, right? Before it worked because it was predicated on we were fully resourced for park maintenance. That is not the case. Right now, back of the envelope math, it's been a while since I've been in the parks chair, but uh, I, I would say we, 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 we definitely have not recovered from the 50% reduction of park maintenance staff. Uh, and to me, it's, it's a simple math arithmetic equation, right? X number of parks, 
you, you need, in my opinion, you, you need at least 6.75 FTEs for, uh, uh, you know, six or seven parks to really kind of dial in, you know, uh, mowing, irrigation, aeration, fertilization, you know, the, the whole nine yards. Uh, we're at two. So this is a problem that is solvable, but it is going to take resources. Oh, great. And I know, I know that we continue. Thank you for that, uh, Uncle. But I know that we continue, all of us up here or even at, at, at the council level, we continue to, 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 to hone in with our human resources department that we need to hire more folks, yeah. right? And I know, I know that there's inter-department uh, meetings and I know that there's, there's memos within departments and I know that there's working groups within departments, but I think for the sake of our, of our community and the sake of our stakeholders and the sake of, uh, of us who represent districts where we have under-resourced uh, parks, I think it is important that we create a solid work plan on on filling in the vacancies within PRNS. Because I'm 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 very sad that the, the last two years, the last two years we were presented a community survey by by Joey Royce, our auditor's office, and the most unpopular department in the city of San Jose. And I'm a I'm I was first hired. In PRNS, the most unpopular department is unfortunately PRNS because of the, of the lack of maintenance of our of our parks. Right? Even though we all know PRNS does amazing things like San Jose, yeah. Even though we still have amazing parks out there, even though we have amazing programs out there, even though we have Viva Calle, Viva Parks, our residents see see PRNS right on the state of our parks and hence why it's one of the most unpopular departments, you know, in two years in a row in that community survey that we just saw last week or two weeks ago, whenever it was. Um, but I told Mr. Chair that I wasn't gonna speak, but, but I think it's very important to, 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 to let our community know that our city is trying and we do see the disparities and, you know, it's gonna take all of us to, to, to change that policy. So, thank you. Avi? Councilmember Torres, thank, thank you for your comments. I do want to just take a quick moment because you talked about hiring and, and just give a huge shout out to our HR department. They've been fantastic partners over the last year and a half. We put in uh, a really uh, aggressive uh, program of hiring one position after the next. Uh, you may recall two years ago, we had something like a 25 to 30 percent vacancy rate in park maintenance. Now we're down to 15, like Tori said. And it's I totally agree with you. Uh, with what we have in the pipeline, we're looking to get to 10% within uh, by the end of March. And uh, also another shout out to, to HR. They've been incredibly open and creative partners with us on how we uh, absolutely streamline the hiring of Resilience Corps. So we're doing things there that are, are really uh, outside the box. So I want to give them a shout out. Great, thank you. And I, I just want to, you know, add to, you know, Councilmember Torres' last comments. We know that you all are doing hard work. We appreciate your work. PRNS is uh, an amazing department that really is a, the backbone to many of our working class families in the city of San Jose. You know, just a lot of these issues are frustrating. They're systemic and, you know, they were happening before you guys were hired here and they're happening now. And I think the conversation around system change and, and partnering with uh, Angel on what we can do, uh, whether it's a memo or something done internal, um, to redesign how our, our parks are funded and uh, maintained um, is important. So um, we look forward to that, that conversation. Um, and, and thank you all for, for the, the, great, um, the great item. Uh, so let's all go for the vote. Thank you. That was unanimous. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next item is D2, Children and Youth Services Master Plan Status Report. I believe there's a 10 minute presentation. Chair sure, Ortiz, I'll, I'll, go ahead and, uh, I'll go ahead and kick us off and then uh, turn it over to the, to the team. But uh, just wanted to kind of 
provide a little bit of a, a background and context. As, as you know, we've been at, at work uh, on a on a pretty extensive journey. This you know over a year now uh, around the development of this children youth master plan. This really kind of uh, ha has its roots uh, right after you know kind of post pandemic, right as we were coming uh, coming out of the pandemic, and we started to see that that the impact on especially children, youth, and families, especially from higher need areas uh, was just really taking a toll on our families, right? And so we wanted to, to make sure that we were uh, being responsive to those needs. And, and, and although we know that the pandemic didn't create these issues, they definitely highlighted them, right? And, um, and, and initially we kind of started with kind of the intention of, well, let's just put together kind of a plan that would figure out how we just work better as a city uh, to serve children and youth. Uh, but as we started to engage people, starting with young people, children, uh, teenagers, for, uh, not, not just your traditional um, kind of outlets uh, uh, such as the Youth Commission and others, but as we started going to community centers and talking to, to, to again, young people and parents and uh, um, caregivers and, and then also schools and superintendents and teachers and uh, nonprofit leaders and uh, we, we started realizing that there was really a need to do more than just put together kind of a strategy around how the city kind of just works better in terms of their program. So, so what, you, what you see uh, kind of evolve over the time is really a, a, a plan that really uh, operationalizes a, 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 this cradle to career approach. A, a lot of us, many of us talk about the need for creating more opportunities you know, one of the best ways to disrupt poverty is, is really through opportunity, right? Uh, we, we all know about the prison pipelines that exist within our own city from certain neighborhoods into certain uh, um, uh, uh, jails and, and ranches and all. And, and so the goal is really how do, we, how do we dismantle those pipelines and really replace them with opportunity uh, pathways, right? And not just one size fits all, uh, recognizing that we have to do this along a whole age continuum, right, from zero to age 24, right? And there's not a, just a one-track fits all, one size fits all, but that, that we really need to kind of create this no wrong door approach that whether you come in through a library program, whether you come in through a parks and rec program, uh, or whether you come in from the county perspective or, or, a, or a nonprofit or a church, that, that, that the system that we have in place is coordinated in such a way that that we're going to kind of continue to kind of help you along that career path, and so that's pretty much what what you'll you'll see here is is a framework. I will uh, caution you that this is still a raw draft. This by no means is the final product. So we really are looking at this meeting here to get additional feedback. Uh, to the framework that we have. We've tested a lot of this out with a lot of, I mean, multiple key stakeholders, um, but this is still a raw draft. We haven't even titled it. That's why you see kind of just, just generic name, Children Youth Master Plan. We actually will have a title for it. Um, but our goal today is to get additional feedback from you all, from the community, um, and then between now and the time that we cross-reference this to the full council, make those additional edits and changes as we go. So. With that background, I'll turn it over to Laura and the team that'll walk us through the, uh, the, the framework. Good, thank you, Angel. Uh, good afternoon, council members and the public. I'm happy to be here to talk about the work that we have done so far. And, and to, as Angel mentioned, we have a draft uh, of the Children Youth Services Master Plan. Um, I'm here with my colleagues and I'll have them introduce themselves. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, my name is Maria De Leon, Deputy Director of the Recreation Division with PRNS. Good afternoon, I'm Michelle Arnott, Deputy Director of Public Services for the Public Library. And I realized that I don't think I introduced myself. Laura Boo is an assistant to the city manager and have been working closely with uh, Angel Rios, Deputy City Manager in the development of the Children Youth Services Master Plan. So as we begin this presentation, um, just want to uh, share that we really tried to shed light and be intentional um, in highlighting the, the challenges and barriers that many San Jose children, youth, and adults experience um, in our community that places them at risk and vulnerable to negative influences, generational trauma, and poverty, lower educational attainment, housing instability, violence, and poor health outcomes. Many of these uh, parents and caregivers will never have an opportunity to achieve their life goals and dreams or full potential, 
and unfortunately, that also impacts their children um, and their own children. And so this is an intergenerational um, issue and challenge. Um, many of them, um, and this is very clear in the data that we have, uh, that we have looked at and researched in depth. If you've had an opportunity to, to look at the master plan, um, you'll note that there are many reports out there uh, locally that shed light on the challenges and issues, whether it's the Santa Clara County Children's Data Book, the Joint Venture Silicon Valley Index Report, our own Santa Clara County uh, Juvenile Justice Data Book, um, as well as many of our own reports. Uh, that considerable investments, initiatives, and services have made inroads, and we should celebrate that. However, the reality is that these disproportionalities and disparities continue to impact specific racial ethnic populations and the same San Jose communities and zip codes year after year. Um, and the park maintenance conversation is, is just a testament to some of those challenges and barriers. Over the years, the city has moved swiftly in advocating and addressing issues of homelessness, safety, blight, and economic development. We hear consistently from families and community stakeholders that it's equally important to elevate the needs of children and youth to that same degree of urgency and call to action. By centering the interests and needs of our youngest residents, we will see short and long-term impacts that will have a rippling benefit to the vibrancy economy, well-being, and future for all of us, uh, for all of us who live, work, visit, and invest and do business in San Jose. While we are fortunate to live in one of the wealthiest cities in the country, and some would say even in the world, uh, we also recognize that the gap winds between those that can participate and benefit in this burgeoning economy and the many children, youth, and young adults that continue to be left out of the prosperity of Silicon Valley. We can learn from history and be innovative and strategic by bringing the county, city, education leaders, families, youth, and community stakeholders together through a collective impact approach to dismantle the systemic racism, structural, and institutional barriers that perpetrate generational cycles of poverty and trauma. So in their place, we can create a safety net of support that centers the hopes, dreams, assets, and voices of San Jose children and youth, and we'll talk a little bit more about that safety net. Um, but I think this quote says it well, that all children and youth deserve to grow up with the confidence that their race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic background, family history, LGBTQ identity, developmental disabilities, or zip codes, that none of these factors taken together or alone will be a barrier to accessing resources and supports and to achieving their dreams and full potential. And how best to show this that in this picture of our San Jose youth and families. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Michelle. The development of the Children and Youth Services Master Plan has been informed by several city council directives, city policies, strategies, and initiatives with goals to support children, youth, and their families. At the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, administration and city staff recognized that children and youth, especially those from specific zip codes who were already experiencing a myriad of socioeconomic challenges, were disproportionately impacted. In response, city staff coordinated to provide tangible support to those most vulnerable. And in the mayor's June 2021 budget message, the city manager's office was directed to develop a comprehensive cradle-to-career youth development master plan. The master plan has been informed by and endeavors to build upon the insight and foundations of the Youth Empowerment Alliance strategic plan, joint special meetings between NSE and the County of Santa Clara Children's Seniors and Families Committee, the City of San Jose Bill of Rights for Children and Young Adults, the Education Digital Literacy Strategy, Education Policy 030, and also the Office of Racial Equity's Racial Equity Impact Analysis, as well as the COVID-19 Recovery Task Force recommendations and allocation of American Rescue Plan funds for children and youth programs. Next slide. The master plan intends to provide a continuum of support for children and youth from cradle to career and is grounded in the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the recognition of the realities of generational trauma and inequities and systemic racism and structural barriers. 
The approach of the master plan and its strategic framework is to provide guidance on policy priorities and investments, to work in partnership with systems leaders, such as Santa Clara County, with the goal of systems transformation and in integrating the service delivery system in order to reduce barriers and increase access to critical services that support the overall, overall well-being of families and their children and youth. It's also to bring diverse sectors of the community together through collective impact, including families and youth, to co-design the integrated delivery system. And lastly, to develop a shared, long-term, sustainable, and measurable outcome for all. To ensure the lived experiences, voices, and expertise of the community, community was reflected throughout the Children and Youth Master Plan, the City Manager's Office, in partnership with the Library, PRNS, Office of Economic Development, Work to Future, Office of Racial Equity, Housing, and other departments engage diverse community stakeholders, such as educational leaders, school district, community-based organizations, child care providers, families, children, youth, and young adults. The community engagement activities, such as focus groups, town halls and listening sessions, advisories and communities, parents and caregiver and youth surveys provided considerable data, feedback, and input from over 120 organizations, 33 focus groups, and 3,004 individuals. The vision, unifying purpose, and guiding values were developed with a community voice. The vision. It's a fostering a future where every child and youth in San Jose blossoms into healthy, resilient, self-sufficient adults enriched with abundant opportunities to live, work, play, dream, and prosper within the vibrant landscape of Silicon Valley. The unifying purpose is to create and expand opportunity pathways and support from cradle to career that develop 21st century skills that lead to better health outcomes, establish sustainable employment, and result in a competitive living wage for San Jose children, youth, and young adults, particularly those who are most vulnerable. And the guiding values include equity, accessibility, and inclusion for all youth, outcomes and results driven, cross-sector collaboration, investment, and accountability, and our youth and community voice driven. From these engagement activities, um, there were emerging themes that, were, that resonated consistently across the various communities, whether it was with middle school students or young adults or service providers or education leaders. These emerging themes and priority areas um, consistently uh, were expressed as needs and challenges and barriers that our community raised. So the, um, the priority areas are early learning and child care with the expected outcome, and I won't read through all of these just in interest of time, but all children experience nurturing adults safe environments that support their optimal physical, cognitive, social, and emotional development. Learning and empowerment, health and mental wellness, housing access and security, meaningful and sustaining jobs, safe, clean, and connected communities. And the overarching challenge and barrier that many communities raised was uh, isolation that happens across uh, city services and programs, but also across the community through different uh, providers, whether it be the county or community-based organizations. And so again, there was this, this interest and need for having a program and services be integrated and connected across all of these systems so that families, especially those that are in crisis or in need of specific services, can easily access them. 
As mentioned previously, while the key deliverable and priority has been the completion of the Children and Youth Services Master Plan, do you want it, the next one? Um, on a parallel process, uh, we also recognize the importance of having a structure or an infrastructure to be able to deliver services in a cohesive, integrated, and coordinated approach. Um, we recognize that we need to have a no wrong door entry that is equipped and responsive to the needs of children, youth, and young adults. No one institution holds the answer. Addressing complex challenges requires a collaborative network of policymakers, multidisciplinary uh, providers, public entities, education leaders, and community members. So as shown in this visual, the city of San Jose plays a critical role in this, in this ecosystem. We play a significant role just as community-based organizations and county agencies and educational institutions. Many of the children that, that uh, have low educational attainment rates or other data points that show high rates of incarceration or uh, citations come from our communities, come from our San Jose communities. And so it's important that we, the city, also be um, a partner in that process. Next slide. The Children Youth Services Master Plan is uniquely positioned to serve as a conduit in bringing families, youth, and community and institutional partners together for transformative systems change that focuses on shifting the current system and strengthening child, youth, family, and neighborhood resiliency. This involves, as was mentioned, uh, working across different city departments to ensure that our own services are integrated so that our families can access those, but then also branching out and ensuring that those same um, integration of services is done with our county departments, our community-based organizations, and our, and our schools. To more intentionally address the emerging themes and priority areas that were raised by community partners, we will build out a coordinated and integrated um, seamless service delivery system at two demonstration sites. In communities that have many strengths and assets, but that we also know are disproportionately impacted, as was mentioned at earlier, whether it's by juvenile arrest records or welfare justice systems uh, involvement, low educational attainment. Families and youth are engaged in the design and delivery of programs and services so that we can lift up and address the barriers and challenges the families and youth experience. They are involved in the code design model that can be replicated in other communities. Having these two demonstration sites will allow us the opportunity to develop a model that we can then be able to expand to other communities who are also underserved and marginalized. Uh, we also wanna note that the demonstration sites will also support the City of San Jose Parks, Recreation, and Neighborhood uh, Youth Empowerment Alliance staff and partners um, as these communities are part of the Opportunity Neighborhoods and it will support them in achieving their key objective um, in their strategic plan. We're also expanding and enhancing and aligning this work with other community efforts, such as the CISA Puede Collective and Franklin McKinley Children's Initiative. Uh, these demonstration sites will be in the Poco, Air, Poco Way area with the attachment neighborhood of Mayfair and Seven Trees, with the attachment neighborhood of Santee. The system of care is embedded in the community um, and it will transcend administration and staff. We want to make sure that this is a sustainable model. Uh, community partners have been at the table. Um, all of the key school districts um, have been already engaged in this process. So our next steps as we move forward is we have done some initial mapping of city program and services just to understand our own resources and supports. Uh, we will be delving um, deeper into this and understanding our evaluation processes in these programs. Um, we're happy to share that we've had some initial conversations with Sobrato Philanthropy and they're very interested in assisting us in the development of, of an evaluation form, framework that will support not only our city programs but also our partnership with our community partners. And so we will um, 
be discussing this uh, in further detail with them as to a timeline um, and as far as uh, who in, in our community will be engaged in this process. As you know, we're also launching soon the Blue Zones Readiness Assessment, um, and we are ensuring that this is also in alignment with the Children Youth Services Master Plan. We have already identified some overlap and, and parallel um, efforts in that um, project. As I mentioned, our demonstration sites, we are already having conversation with community stakeholders, our own staff, um, county departments as well. Um, and youth and family engagement strategies. We conducted, as Angel mentioned and, and was mentioned in this presentation, we have done considerable community engagement just for the development of the Children Youth Services Master Plan. That's only one phase of that. We're also developing a community engagement uh, plan and framework for the work that follows. Um, and we will be doing this so that it is intentional and sustainable um, because we want to make sure that families and youth have an equal role in the code design and implementation of the services. Um, we're also working closely, as I mentioned, with our key partners and our city staff in co-designing the safety net of, save, of, of services. And we're also recognizing that this takes money and it takes leveraging other resources. And so we have been also very committed in exploring sustainable opportunities. We have presented to a number of philanthropies um, and other organizations to identify other funding potential because we know that this has to be a community-wide investment and a community-wide effort. Um, and then also developing a reporting structure so that we can continue to update you, the city council, as well as our community members in our progress. Um, that concludes our presentation. Um, we want to just give a heartfelt thank you to the many city staff and departments um, that have been engaged and involved in every aspect of this process. Um, everything from um, moving chairs uh, at a youth town hall to um, helping disseminate information to our community partners. And so um, with that, we say thank you to our city staff and to our many community partners. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, can we please open it up for a public comment? We had nine speaker cards submitted. Can the following members of the public please line up along the, the steps in front of the podium in no particular order? Uh, Christine Fleming, Tiffany Brooks, Victor Vasquez, Jeremy Barus, Ana Rita Reyes, Marisol Romero, mm -hmm. Gabriel Hernandez, Cleo Cole, Amanda Aldama, and Joe Heredi. You guys will each be given two minutes to speak. Please state your name for the record. The first speaker can make their way down whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Christine Fleming, and I'm a screening program manager at Healthier Kids Foundation. At the foundation, our mission is to remove barriers impacting the health, learning, and life success of Silicon Valley youth through key strategies such as improving healthcare access and utilization, changing health behavior through education, and advocating for health policy and systems change. The Children and Youth Services Master Plan's vision of fostering a future where every child in, the San, in San Jose blossoms into healthy, resilient, self-sufficient adults, enriched with abundant opportunities to live, work, play, dream, and prosper within this vibrant landscape, aligns closely with our organization's mission. We are super excited to be part of the organizations that are committed to addressing the needs of the city's youngest community members with an emphasis on reaching vulnerable children, youth, and their families that have been historically under-resourced, especially through our screening programs. So we provide vision, dental, and screening, and hearing screening programs free of charge at schools throughout the city of San Jose to help rid youth of barriers standing in the way of being able to concentrate on their education. In addition, our comprehensive follow-up process ensures that parents have access to the resources and services necessary to optimize their family's health. Thank you so much for your time and dedication in creating the Children and Youth Services Master Plan and providing organizations such as Healthier Kids Foundation with a strategic roadmap to help align programs that create opportunities toward improved upward mobility for youth and children in this area. Thank you.
Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Tiffany Brooks, and I am a program manager at Healthier Kids Foundation. We are thrilled to see health and mental wellness as a priority in the Children and Youth Services Master Plan. At Healthier Kids Foundation, we provide universal school-based wellness checks for fifth grade students and have found that 43% of our fifth graders have unmet emotional health needs, with 3% being imminent risk at the time of the wellness check. Providing adequate services to our students is crucial at this time. We are excited to be included as one of the organizations that are committed to addressing the needs of the city's youngest communi community members and their families. We work hard to identify students who have unmet needs and support them reaching appropriate services and, and care. Any student who is identified through our wellness check is assigned to a case manager who not only calls their parents and walks them through the resources that are available, but also guides them to obtaining these services, which could include behavioral health, counseling, resources for food, housing, and much more. Thank you for prioritizing the Children and Youth Services Master Plan and providing organizations like ours with a guide to align programs and services for, um, that serve our young and vulnerable youth, at a, <laughs> provide crucial services for our family and community. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon, Victor Vasquez. Somos Mayfair's Isa Puede Collective and the Isa of the Peace Partnership. You know, we are place-based organizations led by folks of color, and we spend hundreds and thousands of hours listening to our constituents, doing community engagement. We live and die with that in our, in our lives because we see it every day. That's our reality. We don't, we don't leave the block. We leave the block to maybe take a, take a nap once in a while, but that's the reality that we live with so that I, I like the fact that we've done a lot of surveys and community engagement, and I also think that the need for urgent action is now. It's time to build a system of care, especially for children and youth of color, because we know that we're hurt, we're incarcerated, and yes, we are dying right now, in the streets as well. And the Children's and Youth Master Plan is attempting to build a system of care to make sure that our children, our youth, and our families have quality education, childcare, housing, job opportunities, health services, and pathways to be the next generation of leaders. In the end, I believe that part of the intention is to make sure that the children and youth and their families long, live long and fulfilling lives with purpose, a sense of be belonging, and dignity. That is from the womb to the tomb. Um, so our call to action to, to you today is for for you to continue to support this work and to make sure that also children in District 7 get that opportunity. I live in District 7. And we want to make sure that you move this forward and work with policy aides to look at what are the long-term sustainable funding solutions that we can learn from to make this happen. We can't go year to year, uh, budget to budget on this. So our collective organizations are committed to working with you, the city, the county, Everybody that wants to make sure that services and organizing are aligned to fact. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon. Jeremy Bruce, Amigos de Guadalupe, Center for Justice and Empowerment. We're also part of the CISA Puedo Collective. Thank you for taking a huge step in our uh, Children and Families Master Plan for our East San Jose families. We all know that our families have so much to gain from this master plan. Our community committee, led by Amigos de Guadalupe and Somos Mayfair, made up of grassroots community leaders, advocated for the master plan last budget season through the budget process, and are committed to staying engaged with the city and other stakeholders to maximize the impact for our East San Jose community, provide a net of support for our families so they have all the element, elements to thrive in our city. We are asking that you support this work that has been done so far and to support the work moving forward over the next several years and ensure that the work around this master plan is community-centered 
and we look forward to supporting our families in our neighborhoods and you can always count on the CSEP Puedo Collective and Amigos de Guadalupe as a, a trusted partner through this process. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Good afternoon, uh, our council members and the public. My name is Ana Reyes and I work in Grill Pami Services. I am the Early Care and Education Director of Program. So we are part of Chichi Freddy Collective. We compose of Amigo de Guadalupe, Grill Family Services, School of Art, of Cultures, Somos Maper, and Vigilation. Our organization coordinates our services to support our families in Maper community and surrounding neighborhood. I am the resident here for 21 years and working with my community. Last year, part of our work to align our services among our five organizations, we organized a group of neighborhood residents to help define what services we should advocate, a part of the city budget process. Some of the funding we wanted invested in our neighborhood was related to COVID recovery money, the ARPA fund, some of the funding areas were related to neighborhood service budget. Our families will continue to participate in the process of implementing the Cities of the Children and Youth Master Plan. We continue to request that you invest the funding for the service to support our children and youth. We are proud of the work of our family that we have done to participate in developing and supporting this master plan. They are committed to ensure that they are raised the children in safe and vibrant neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Good afternoon, my name is Marisol Romero and I work with the CISA Puede Collective. And um, the collective is made up of our five nonprofit organizations here in East, in East San Jose, Amigos de Guadalupe, Grail Family Services, School of Arts and Culture, Somos Mayfair, and Vegilution. Our organizations coordinate our services to support our families in Mayfair and surrounding neighborhoods. For almost two years now, some of our organizations have been, have been participating in the joint meetings on the Children and Youth Master Plan between the city, between San Jose City and Santa Clara County to coordinate services for our families. We have presented at some of these meetings and have worked with your city staff to develop this Children and Youth Master Plan. We are asking that you support the work that has been done thus far and to support our work moving forward over the next several years. Our collective organizations are committed to work with the city and the county to align our services and organizing to support our families in our neighborhoods. Thank you, next speaker. Good afternoon, uh, Gabriel Hernandez, the director of the CISA Puede Collective. Um, you've got to recognize your staff. Um, People like Angel have done the work. They've been there. Laura and the work that we've done over the, it's been, I think, almost two years. <laughs> the, the process of cast, this whole thing where the county and the city and different organizations are going to try and, um, you know, put our services together and stuff, and that kind of fell to the wayside. But different ones of us are saying, you know what, we're still going to do cast. We're still going to go forward with this thing. The amount of staff time with the five organizations that we're talking about that we've donated, because we're not getting paid for this. Um, if you look at the first slide that you had, the nine bubbles, I've been involved in, I think, seven of those bubbles, or, or the collective has, or the organizations have. Even the digital divide one, I think, Omar, you may have been the only one there. The rest, you weren't here for that process. So imagine the responsibility that we have that you're putting on the collective. And, and I think it's kind of cool because Pokeway, someone put a freeway in between our neighborhood. And so it's like Pokeway is on the other side of our neighborhood, but whatever, we'll do it. And so I think um, uh, the commitment that we have, and then this uh, other important piece, the community uh, engagement process. Um, like uh, Jeremy talked about, we already have community already involved in this process. And so now we're gonna structure it in a way where we're gonna, you know, uh, codify that, right, and really make this thing happen. So I'm very proud to, of the work that we've done. And like I told you, you want to go get that money from those people with the money, let's lock arms and let's go. I'll get it. All right, thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Okay. 
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amanda Aldama Fernandez, and I am the Spartan Eastside Promise Program Lead at San Jose State University. I had the honor of supporting the development of the Children and Sur Youth Services Master Plan, and over a decade ago, I also had the pleasure of serving on the San Jose Youth Commission when the Children and Youth Bill of Rights was adopted by San Jose City Council. I am thrilled, as well as hopeful, that the city is considering the implementation of the Children and Sur Youth Services Master Plan. Growing up, I was fortunate enough that my family found the various programs and services that I benefited from and can personally attest to how vital not only the existence of these services are, but that there is a cohesive community effort led by the city in partnership with the county to ensure transparent access for all San Jose youth and their families. Outside of my own experiences, I've also witnessed how the students I've worked with have struggled academically, financially, and with their mental and physical health due to either lack of knowledge or lack of access to sustainable resources. Coordination is key to foster an environment where every child and young adult in San Jose has the support they need for their growth and development. Having a more comprehensive structured approach as outlined in this plan not only aligns with the efforts we are seeing across the state for cradle and career programs, but this guideline I truly believe is a positive step in the direction for equitable access, safer neighborhoods, and is the foundation we need to genuinely establish a community that is collectively invested in a citywide effort for the development holistically for our youth. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Hello, my name is Cleo Cole. I'm with the Youth Liberation Movement. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak. So I've known about the Children and Youth Services Master Plan for a, over a year, and I was glad to hear that the city of San Jose was taking the problems of young people seriously and really addressing the sort of dire conditions that a lot of young people are in in this city. Um, and I've sort of followed the progress of this master plan and I finally got to see a draft of it. Um, I read through the whole thing um, and I was really glad to see that the master plan was going into specifics about the living conditions of so many young people in San Jose. So it, some of the things that it addressed was the fact that the median monthly rent here is $2,729, and that households must earn over $120,000 a year to afford a two-bedroom apartment, along with the fact that the high, the high cost of housing, inflation, and stagnant wages are leading to a lot of poverty here, um, and that the top 10% of households in Silicon Valley held 66% of the wealth. All of these things I see every single day. I talk about these things with my peers, um, and I was really glad to see that these were being addressed. But then I kept reading, um, and I saw that the master plan was focusing on helping children, youth, and families become more resilient to bad conditions through applying program services and practices. I don't think that we should have to be more resilient. I think that the city has a responsibility to change these bad conditions, and I think that with 10.5 million dollars on the table for this master plan. It should be going towards helping change those bad conditions instead of um, putting the onus on us to be more resilient with the help of programs and services. There are things that can be done, systemic. Thank you, next speaker. Just go. <laughs> Greetings. My name is Joe Herity. I'm a D6 resident uh, where I'm raising two little San Joseans. Um, I'm also a community activist for young people. I want San Jose to be the best place for children to grow and families to thrive. I also feel it's important to say uh, that I put my money where uh, my mouth is, specifically as a volunteer. I serve on the city's uh, Work to Future Youth Committee, and I proudly serve as an ally to the youth liberation movement. I want to be absolutely clear. Uh, I am thrilled that this process has begun. In 2021, on two occasions, I made public comment in support of the ideas by then council members Arenas and Carrasco to encourage the city to develop a master plan for children and youth. I'm glad that we've gotten started. And this draft is insufficient. 
First, I want to acknowledge the good start. I love the guiding principles, the seven strategic priorities, and the intent to deliver an integrated services from cradle to career. Second, I want to name concerns. There's a lack of an integrated focus that comes through. Feels a bit like a basket of buzzwords and aspirational outcomes beyond what the city or even many players involved have control over, and it seems likely to be buried in bureaucracy. What I hope to see much more present in future drafts are two things. One, structural visibility. This is the work of a community. This cannot be buried in a committee meeting that occurs when most people must be at work. It must be lifted up and made fully visible. This cannot be a report to council once per year, as mentioned on page seven. I would love to see a broad-based community oversight and advisory council fully reflective of the incredible breadth of diversity that makes San Jose special with routine data-driven touch points to the plan. This creates more opportunities for meaningful engagement. Second, measurability. I would like to see a vision that is more specific, time-bound, and measurable, and which cascades through subsequent goals. We must read the same top-line goals in the plan or our efforts will scatter. Even if meant to be aspirational, I think naming a specific target is useful in the vision, and it must address how the city will measure the change in organizational practices that build. Thank you, and back to the committee. Thank you. Looking at the hands, uh, Councilmember Torres, please begin. Great. One, uh, thank you so much for our, our staff on, on this work, and and the report, very detailed report, very extensive work, obviously, from, from our staff and our, our partners, community stakeholders. And again, thank you for our community stakeholders for, for coming down and, and sharing your thoughts and concerns. It's uh, very important to us. And don't want to sound cliche, but investing in our youth is investing in our future, and, and, and we know that, right? Uh, I was in Councilmember Carrasco's office when we worked on a budget document where the idea of a cohesive and comprehensive youth services department was birthed. As a result, the city of San Jose has embarked on a very meaningful journey to ensure that our youth are not overlooked, but rather giving all the support they need and deserve to have a productive and fruitful life in Silicon Valley. I am very proud that I worked for Councilmember Carrasco and our amazing East San Jose community when this idea was vetted and eventually passed into the budget, right? So yes, thank goodness. So in that spirit, I do want to highlight data in this report that I find alarming. You know, there's a lot of great stuff that has been happening, that continues to happen, but these statistics are alarming. On page 32, over 45% of our workforce have a BA or higher, but Latinos, Latinas, Latin, Latinx, hover at 17% income levels. On page 35, the medium is 98,000, but, or the median household wages is 98,000, or income, I'm sorry. But for our Latino workforce, it's 40,000 K. 40,000 K. That is living in the life of poverty. Poverty that they've probably been living in their whole lives, unfortunately. As we look through the report, I review other materials that pertain to our youth development and achievement. The story repeats itself with black and Latino kiddos having dismal literacy and math results, right, at 11 to 18 percent proficiency. And this morning, because, you know, when we're not reading materials here, right, we love reading about the news. I read an article today where 17% of our students at a, community, at a community college transfer to a four-year, but drops 11% when a student comes from an under-resourced community. In 2000, Prop 10, the syntax that passed, allowed a synergy to begin and result where we're all speaking the same language with thorough understanding that early childhood years specifically zero to five, 
are the most important, and we all know that. This has translated into millions poured into every year for early childhood development and education, including quality childcare and preschool. We've invested millions for tutoring, extended day learning, after school programming to improve literacy and math scores. However, I am concerned that we are not looking at system changes that address young adults from grades eight to 12 ensuring that they are meeting AG requirements, that they are exposed to career pathways, understand the college entrance, entrance process, and have the support needed for them to embark in an educational journey where they're not earning $40,000 a year. So what we are doing is we are training the pilot, taking them on a test flight, help them, helping them graduate from flight school, and then handing them a faulty airplane with no control whatsoever. We promised our kiddos that if they went to school, they would see better days, but even in this report, I unfortunately don't see that reported. On page 74 and 79, appendix two, there is no mention of support of our students, and I would like to see that reflected more specifically. I would like us to invest in the young adult who does not know he needs two or more years of foreign language to meet eight through G requirements, or that they need sub substantial volunteer work, volunteer work or internships. Most importantly, I am stunned that the timeline to do this work is 2027. Our amazing community leader, Victor, just mentioned that our black and Latino youth are dying every single day on our streets whether they are in a gang, or unhoused, or just being somewhere at the wrong place at the wrong time, 2027 is too late. And so with that, I do have questions, and I hope that we can, we can answer them. I don't know how much I, time I have left at this point, but I guess we have, that's why we have a chair. Four minutes. That's probably not enough, but I'll go to round two. Okay. So uh, the first question is, where, uh, where are the steps aimed at supporting our young adults through college readiness, and what does that look like uh, in this report? So uh, we did reference it in the, what we're calling the action plans in the attachment. Um, so a lot of this work, as you know, is being led by Work to Future, um, through their numerous uh, programs that are federally funded, but also uh, the library through their college and career pathways. Um, the Youth Liberation Movement has been involved with that, as well as community partners around the Youth uh, 2.0 Forum. Um, so I can say that they have been working on that, and their plan and goal is to create a college to career pathways. We have been very engaged from the city manager's perspective, recognizing and understanding that it has to align with the Children Youth Services Master Plan. Um, I don't know if the library wants to share anything more about that. Sure, Michelle. Thank you, Council Member. Um, it is um, the College and Career Pathways sits with the library, and we are working on an integrated plan with our county partners, with um, our community stakeholders to identify gap analysis and to see where we are across the, the city with where those opportunities and pathways lie. And um, within that college and career pathways, we look at things like the resilience core pathway that we have, um, call, career online high school comes there, and also looking at how we're going to um, create um, these sort of systemic change with our partners like NCCPC, looking at how we can make college or trades any of that education um, a reality through educating families and through also educating you know, the students, but realizing that we have to come together. Um, so many agencies are doing great work around the city, but it's a matter of being able to create those, those connections and then make that public in a way that we get to share that so that way, um, somebody who has information on the left hand knows what the right hand is and to be able to connect those together. So we're absolutely committed to that. And we're hoping and we're going to align that with the work of the master plan. So that way it sits, it sits, it sits in tan, 
almost in parallel but connected. Okay, and and this next question is not to uh, not to harp on our library because as a liaison, I love libraries, and I love that committee. But this is no way on you know doubting what our library services does. But why are library services coordinating our children and youth master plan? My apologies. It's not the Children Youth Services Master Plan. It's a college and career pathways. Um, and that was an initiative that was started before I came on board. So the college and career pathways came out of the, the looking at the community development from the Google Development Fund. And so we have a three-year position funded to look at those pathways as part of that program. And so then that's going to then feed back into this larger um, citywide initiative. No, I, and I, I'm sorry if I didn't ask that correctly, but when this comes to fruition, and I hope it does, I've been told that it's going to go underneath libraries, right? Councilmember, that decision hasn't been made. It, it will go to the, it'll move from the city manager's office to either PRNS or the library, but we have not made that decision. Okay. <clears throat> what will inform that decision is really kind of the structure and the framework that has been, um, you know, agreed upon. And, and Laura, do you have this that you could put up on the? We don't, we don't have that as a uh, to project on the screen, but the council members have it as an attachment in the packet. Okay. Is there any way that we could get this maybe to? Um, because I, I, I think if we kind of go over the framework and the outcome, that'll address some of the questions that you have around structure as well as some of the comments that we've received. Um, okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Angel, if I could also jump yes. in. Hi, yeah. Jill Bourne, City Librarian. Hi, Jill. Hi, Council Member. I'm not harping on the library, just letting you oh, know. Oh, I know. <laughs> Thank you so much for saying that. But um, yeah, I think that the answer to your question really lies in the fact, as you know, that the library has been doing work that's specifically related to education, which is in alignment with the library's mission. And so we've been coordinating with schools for some time. And um, we have a number of what we call planks from early education to um, grade level in, at math, in math and reading at third grade to college and career programs to digital equity programs, right? And so we've been doing this work for some time, but it doesn't, it doesn't you know, cover the entire picture of child well-being or family well-being or what this Children Youth Master Plan covers. We're really focused on education. And so what we've been doing is we're, gonna, we're continuing that work, but we're really working to work citywide and with partners to understand how that education work that we've been doing will integrate with a broader master plan. So right now the library is still the lead in that educational space, but it doesn't mean that we'll be, you know, managing health care or, or you know anything that might not be um, pertinent to our role great no, Does that I'm, make sense yes no thank you and, and before I yield my time I do have two more questions left but I'll wait for the, the second round um, but um, I think this is why it's important that that I know that the original intent of the budget document back I forgot what year it was at this point 2018 2019 is that we we brought in all the services for, for youth and families into one department. And I know there's multiple, but I think that's why it's, it's still important. And I still want to see one day a, you know, an office of youth development or office of youth services in our city. So I'll ask my questions. All right, yeah, two minutes over there. Yes. Thank you. Um, Council Member Candelas. Thank you. Um, I, I, I want to just start off by thanking um, our partners who came and spoke and, and provided feedback on, on the draft plan that came out. Um, and, and, you know, in addition to, to our community uh, partnerships, I also want to thank staff. I know this has been a heavy lift and a long time coming to see the 100 plus page draft, uh, which I was ex excited to, to dig into. And, um, you know, um, I think the best opportunity to be able to make changes, obviously, is in the budget, um, which um, I know. Uh, T t takes uh, not just resources, but it, it takes trade-offs. Um, and I've heard from uh, from talking to residents that public safety is a big concern. And and yes, as a city, we're leaning in on on trying to rebuild our our uh, our law enforcement uh, uh, force. Uh, but at the same time, I think we we need to invest upstream of the issue. And this this is right along uh, with 
uh, with that the, the theme of public safety in our city and investing in, in safer communities. Um, the only problem is we will see this two, three, four years from now, but um, it will be the most cost-effective way for us as a city to move the needle on safer communities, uh, by and large, and, and this report tells us, tells us that. Um, and, and, you know, I'm excited to the work that needs to be done and, and, and to where we are at this point. Um, but um, I, I do have, uh, there was a question that was posed by a member of the public, actually, on, on the uh, community advisory role that we would be have going forward. I know that the, there's a community advisory uh, committee that was composed of drafting a good chunk of, of the, the conversations of, of the master plan, the draft master plan itself. Uh, but I'd love to hear from staff on what they envision to continue to have a, a, a community voice and a community input as part of our, uh, our iterative process with regards to the master plan. Yes, thank you, council member. Uh, yes, um, Ashley, in the uh, master plan, we have a draft. Um, we're calling it a teaming structure, or advisory, uh, very much as what you're asking for. It is a draft, it is a proposal. Of course, we want to make sure that this is vetted with our community. Um, but I will tell you that we have put thought in making sure that we have youth, young people at the table, families and communities um, at the table, as well as our many diverse partners. Um, if you happen to have the master plan, it's, it's, it's here uh, visually. Um, in addition to that, we also want to leverage uh, policymakers to make sure that any issues or challenges that are, that are, that are being experienced by our, by our community partners and our families and our youth is being raised up to uh, policymakers so that they're hearing directly from the community about what those barriers are, right? If we're referring a young person or a number of young people to health services and they're not getting the screenings or assessments done or whatever those uh, uh, challenges or barriers are, that that's being raised to our policymakers, say it be the county uh, behavioral health, right? Um, we're also going to be reporting to um, the Youth Empowerment Alliance policy team because as you know, we have the mayor, we have city council members there, we have board of supervisors. These are folks that can, that can move the needle and make decisions on these policies um, that are being raised directly by the community. Um, we're also, um, it has been mentioned in other conversations and in the master plan is that we're leveraging other community efforts. So that it's just not the city of San Jose saying we need to, we need to fix the system, but also having, again, those folks who can make those decisions um, to fix the system or to change it um, or to revamp it, whatever it is that, that we as a community decide. And so we've been very strategic to, to have those conversations now with those partners and not wait until after the master plan is adopted. Okay, great. No, that, that, that's good. And, and obviously this is still a draft and, um, and, and I, I, I expect to, to for us, as not just as, as as leadership, but as staff, to be to have our, our thumb on the pulse, to be able to be engaging in two-way dialogue with with our community. For you know, they're they're the folks who are on the street day in day out, interacting with our youth, and 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 quite frankly, you know, seeing seeing anecdotal firsthand incident inc incidents of, of of what's going on. So, uh, I appreciate that, and and you know, there's there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but I, I appreciate um, you know my predecessor. Uh, her, her passion on this as well and, and know that there's a lot of work to do and, and look forward to doing it. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll move acceptance of the staff report. Second. So we are going to go to Council Member Dewan since he hasn't gone yet. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. I just got a quick question. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you. I mean, that's a very thorough report with the attachment A, B, and C. Um, just a quick on uh, question on health and, and, and mental wellness. Our children at this point is, is under a lot of cyber bully, online bullies, and, and, and so on. And a lot of these children do not have access to, you know, mental health care. And they're afraid to reach out and ask for help. How do we go about to get them 
from A to B in order to get the help that they need. Thank you, Council Member. Um, yes, we actually have had um, those discussions already with our uh, county partners, but also our community-based organizations. There's a clear, uh, we all recognize that children need um, mental health services and, and just general support with their social emotional development. Um, in our own focus groups, I had a young woman, <clears throat> I want to say she was about 14, and said all she wanted was an adult to talk to. Not because she needed medication or because she was in crisis, but she just said it would be great to just have an adult person that I can talk to. And so I say that because behavioral health, mental health issues come in a continuum, right? Some young people just need a caring adult to listen to them. And we have the high end where you have a young person who needs possibly medication or, or crisis interventions and those kinds of things. So we're talking about the overall health and well-being of the young person. And so yes, to your question, that is exactly what we're talking about is how do we make sure that those services are available in the community so that a young person doesn't have to ride two buses to get to a behavioral health specialist. Um, and I can say that the county is very interested in that approach as well, and, and that's very much what they're committed to as well as the school districts. And so it's, a, it's about leveraging all those different resources and opportunities, and I, again, identifying how best do we remove those barriers so that families and young people can easily access those services. So, Yes, it's very, uh, first and foremost, on our list of things that we need to begin addressing immediately. And some of those will be much easier than others, but um, it's very, very important. And yes, thank you. Thank you. I, I know that we, we have the you know, suicide hotline. Anyone can call in and, and anonymously. We don't want to go to that end. <laughs> we want to go towards... Uh, access online easy enough because children these days are very um, <clears throat> adopt to technology and, and, and they're really really good at it and they can communicate in, in much more in depth way in depth when they just online being anonymous and, and saying hey this is how I feel was what I think and, and this is what happening to me um, because I, I think well, a lot of kids are afraid to, to meet someone in, in person because they give up their identity, they're vulnerable. And, and so do we have any program that they can just, you know, get online and say, hey, I'd like to have someone I can chit chat with or, or talk to, either the professional or adult. Um, you know, sometimes we, we have a lot of volunteers, right? that can, can reach out as well, but obviously still, those have to be vetted to make sure mm -hmm. they're, they're safe for, uh, for our children. Yes, yeah, so the county has a number of, of programs, both online and uh, call-in numbers. Um, they also do run a number of youth hubs um, in the county and in the city. Um, there's actually one uh, in downtown. Um, where young people can drop in and receive that type of, of support. But again, it's, it's making sure that the information gets out, right? Um, I also want to acknowledge that many of the youth programs that our city staff run, whether it's PRNS in the library, providing young people the opportunity to connect with a caring adult or even with their peers is also instrumental in their social emotional development and their well-being. And so it's, it's important that we elevate both, making sure that young people understand what resources are out there, and if there is a gap that we're working with our community stakeholders to figure out how we address those gaps, whether it's going out for external funding or figuring out how shifting some of our own resources and supports to be able to address those needs. Thank you, and uh, again, I just want to say thank you for the extensive report and, and all the incredible work especially with all the um, community groups that come together to help our youth. Uh, for that, I yield my time. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Torres.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I didn't know if we were gonna if you were gonna say a few words, but um, sure. okay. <laughs> so, because in this round I have less than the minutes allocated, I'm gonna ask my two questions, and then you can give me the answer. Because then I'm out, I'm also gonna uh, ask for a friendly amendment from uh, Councilmember Candela. So, um, my two questions are: How can we uh, how how can we incorporate and identify partners? Um, like 10,000 degrees, San Jose Community College, or LEAF, uh, when it comes to um, when it comes to creating a plan for our youth who are you know eighth to twelfth graders, right? Um, and of course, our strategy not being pushed out to 2027. And and then lastly, uh, how are we resourcing the next steps, and how much and where is the this money coming from? Uh, so those are the two questions before I do my, my, friendly, my friendly amendment or my friendly motion. Yeah. I'll answer the first one. So um, I just want to reiterate the community engagement efforts that happened were for the development of the Children Youth Services Master Plan. It's not lost on us that that needs to continue. Um, and so. As I, as I was mentioning, we are still working on engaging the larger community and larger community stakeholders because if we are to create college to career pathways, um, making sure that young people have opportunities to explore different career options and those kinds of things, that we need to expand our partnerships. So yes, there's there will be many, many opportunities to engage diverse community stakeholders. Um, we will have priority areas around the seven that were mentioned, so whether it's, it's early learning and childcare or um, meaningful and sustaining jobs, um, there'll be opportunities to engage um, community stakeholders with expertise um, in those areas or who are just interested or, or passionate about those areas. And so this is not an exclusive partnership. The more partners we can get at, at the table, of course, it just makes it that much more beneficial to our larger community. And I'll hand the other question to Angel. Yeah, Councilmember, the sec the, in terms of the budget, what we did was of the 10.5 in ARP dollars that we received, we had set aside a little over $1 million specifically to allocate around these recommendations. So through the budget process, we'll be making some recommendations uh, for the use of those funds. Uh, we're looking at piloting two locations, uh, as, as, as you heard in the report, to, to, to really test this work out. Uh, and then on a parallel track, also working with philanthropy, we've, we've uh, reached out to several. We have a number of philanthropy foundations that have expressed very strong interest in helping to fund and, and uh, um, cover the cost for some of this. And then going forward, we, we would, as we implement this work, we see us coming with recommendations wherever there are gaps in resources that are specific to the city, we'll be using the budget process to do that. Uh, I also wanna clarify that the 2027 date, that is a by 2027. So that, that doesn't mean that the work starts in 2027, that means it starts now, and our goal is to get it complete by 2027, um, just from a timing standpoint. Okay, great. Great, thank you, uh, Angel. And then, can, can I? I'm sorry. Can I just add yes. to that too that we yeah. really want this to be a live document, and so yeah. white paper. Yes, and mm -hmm. so if it needs to be extended beyond 2027, we're we're absolutely uh, yeah. for that. Great, thank you. Thank you. And then I'm offering a friendly amendment because I know Councilmember Candela's just motion to to accept the report. Uh, however, I want to if. You agree, Councilmember Candelas, I would like to direct staff to incorporate the feedback from today from not only our community stakeholders, um, but from us, right? And cross-reference it to uh, a city, uh, th our city council meeting, maybe before April, yeah. before April, 2024. Uh, just to double check with Angel, we're okay with that? We can make it work? Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Don't make me sub motion now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll second that. Great, thank you. I want to begin my comments by thanking staff and the array of community partners who've come together to essentially start to reverse the years and effects of 
intergenerational inequality in our city. It's important that we speak truth to power and say that there was intentional uh, decisions that brought us to where we are here today and that's made this work that we're doing necessary. Redlining, underinvestment, the pulling of investment, the school to prison pipeline, and in short, the stigmatization of, of people of color has effectively ensured that generations of, of our youth, especially in our districts here, are kept from upward mobility. That's why this work is, is so important. The impacts of this plan hopefully will serve to empower these communities that were most harmed by the underinvestment and the compound effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. For some, it may feel like we're out of the COVID-19 woods, but the impacts for our communities are long lasting and will continue to be seen if we don't work together to address them. That's why I'm so thankful for our predecessors before us, former council member Magdalena Carrasco and now supervisor Silvia Rennes, who truly championed um, this plan. And of course, to our, our city staff, Angel Rios, Laura Buzo, and the many members of our library department, PRNS, our city manager, OED, and housing. Thank you for leading this work um, with the care it actually deserves. Finally, a huge gratitude to the over 120 community-based organizations and faith leaders, school districts, representatives, county partners, law enforcement, and philanthropies um, who serve our youth day to day and still found time to engage with our staff, making sure that this plan is robust uh, and inclusive. Uh, I'm moved by this report, well, this draft plan personally because I was uh, a former gang impacted youth uh, in Eastside San Jose. And I know what it's like to face these challenges of those past policy decisions and I'm committed to ensuring that the opportunities that were afforded to me, those programs that helped me leave that lifestyle are afforded to all youth here in the city of San Jose. I'm excited to hear that both Pokeway and the Mayfair neighborhood of East San Jose will serve as a demonstration site uh, piloting the impacts of this, this plan. For those who may not know, um, the Mayfair neighborhood of East San Jose, formerly known as Sal Si Puedes, or get out if you can in English, is historically underinvested um, in one of our more predominant immigrant communities in East San Jose. And it was referenced by author Stephen Pitty in his book, The Devil in Silicon Valley. Residents gave the area its nickname as a mock tribute to its economic underdevelopment and the lack of attention given by city and county officials. This description is twofold as it also spoke to the challenges of physically leaving the area as moving vehicles sank deep into the mud of unpaved and underdeveloped streets. To that end, um, this is a question for staff, can you share more about the pilot and what it will entail and what our neighborhood residents in those areas, both in the east side and, and, and Santee can expect, but from the pilot? Yes. So let me preface this by saying that we could have come to you with, with the full infrastructure of what this model will look like. But um, again, we wanted to be true to our message that this is about community engagement. And so um, we want to make sure that young people and families are at the table, our community uh, stakeholders who are in those neighborhoods day in and day out, as well as our education leaders. And so. Um, we have just started the conversations, but the idea is that we want to create a space that regardless of where that child or family enters, they will have access to services. And so whether that happens within the school or a community-based organization or within our own community centers or libraries, that that will happen. Um, and so we're giving ourselves these next um, nine months to, to really develop that because, again, we want to make sure that our, our engagement of families and youth is intentional. We don't want it to be just for the sake of having them at the table, but that, it's, that, their, that their input is, is value and is integrated in the design. Um, so yes, so we have already engaged, as we mentioned, the, the, the uh, CISA Puede Collective, our Franklin McKinley Children Initiative Partners, our own Youth Empowerment Alliance, uh, Project HOPE staff. Um, as you know, they're pretty ingrained in the community as well. And so 
Um, so that's our approach around the, the outreach and engagement and the design of this, of this infrastructure, creating this safety net for the community. Well, thank you. Please know that um, you have the full support of my office at, as we move forward with that. Um, addressing youth homelessness, which has become, which it was already a crisis, but um, Allen Rock is definitely an epicenter within the city, my district. Um, it's due to that, it's gonna be a key priority for my office and, and my, my term. Um, because I've de developed relationships with superintendents, especially Glenn Vanderzee um, at the Eastside Union High School District. And it's saddening, um, though not surprising, that at Eastside Union, um, the district has approximately 900 unhoused students compared to 300 in 2020. Um, so it's you know, more, than, more than doubled. Um, and as a former school board member, this is also horrifying to me. Um, and I know that it's written within the plan that families that are financially stable and live in well-resourced communities can provide their children with academic support and enrichment activities and tend to be better equipped to navigate the school system to, school system to advocate for their, their students' needs. And although we have safety nets in place, the challenges of instability are traumatizing and can have lasting effects. So knowing this, what strategies will be implemented to ensure that these students are given the opportunity to succeed, are, are homeless or vulnerable to be homeless population? Yes, um, so we have been engaging with the housing department. Um, and so we're really leaning on their expertise and support to help us kind of navigate that area because of course that's not our expertise. Um, so we will continue to work with them as, as we develop this infrastructure and how do we make sure that we're connecting our young people, to your point, those that are, that are unhoused or on the verge of being unhoused. Mm -hmm. um, and so they have been very open and have been engaged uh, from the very beginning. So while I don't have the specific details now, we have those conversations in place and, and Angel can, can probably add to that as well. Um, and then also around just the academic support, right? Um, again, LM Rock, um, Eastside Union High School, Franklin McKinley have been at the table from the beginning, as well as our, our amazing staff here from both the, the library and PRNS. So again, it's leveraging those different efforts and figuring out where are the gaps. We know that school districts have been receiving additional funding from the state. Um, and so, Again, just kind of understanding that landscape and figuring out where are the gaps and, and figuring out where do we need to leverage our existing resources or go out and, and bring additional funding into these. Um, Ajo, I don't know if you want to mention anything about housing specifically. Yeah, yeah I, I think this question gets right to a lot of what we heard, especially coming out of these side families where they said, hey, look, listen, we're not necessarily homeless right now, but we are really scared about losing our current household situation, right? And which is why we kind of called out the housing access and security. So as we look at doing this work, the way this would play out in, in the neighborhood is that this has to go beyond like, okay, let's wait till somebody becomes homeless and then we send out a homeless response team. It's too late. This has to be around, okay, how, how as we're engaging with families and as we're helping maybe their four-year-old get through a, 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 a scholarship uh, preschool program, getting ready to learn, uh, it, we're using our educational uh, digital program to get the, the family Wi-Fi, and we're working with one of the adults, uh, in adult or more adults in that family, to look at how can we uh, we 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 increase your potential for uh, salary revenue, right? Getting it down to that level of practicality, right? Everything can't be done in the form of a program, a library program, a parks and rec program. It's going to be done. It's going to come down to how do we help low-income families that are right now, many of which are underpaid. And you heard that the the household income. You know, we have over 150,000 households in our city living way b b beneath the poverty line. That's that 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 in itself is 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 you know problematic. But how then do we work with these families to then increase their earning potential, right? So this also means that 
the, the different nonprofits, the, the city, the county, uh, faith community, private sector, we have to look at this situation different. It's not just let me provide you what I, I'm, uh, I'm set up to provide, but rather how do we meet the families at their point of need, mm -hmm. right? And so th this really inverts a lot of the way we've been doing our work, right, with, 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 these, with, with these families. And so when you think about work the future, it's working with the youngsters in the household, but then also how then do we also work with the adults in the household to, to, uh, to address economic mm -hmm. prosperity goals? Right, and that's much more labor intensive, um, and and harder to do. But if we're going to disrupt poverty, that's what we're going to have to do. Right. No, th thank you, thank you for that. And I, the, my reasoning for mentioning that is our students can't learn if they are worried about where they're going to sleep. And I, you know, and I, I, my parents own their home, or better yet, the bank owned their home, and uh, we were in foreclosure three times when, when I was a kid, and I remember that. Uh, greatly, you know, mm -hmm. watching my parents cry at the kitchen table, wondering how we were going to, you know, pay our mortgage. So I know a lot of a lot of the stress and trauma that our youth face today come from economic um, mm -hmm. shortfalls. Um, and that being said, and I, I know this is something that actually my colleague, Councilmember Torres, um, and and I have been talking about. Have we explored um, adding? to the universal basic income pilots, pilots for, for youth here in the city of San Jose? I, I think that's, for example, a good, another good example of something that we, we would do in this situation, right, is, is how do we expand that, you know, that pilot? How do, we, how do we expand those types of programs that provide the immediate need the families that are uh, that that are in need are in need right now, right? So yes, we're going to be working these issues. We're going to be working towards system transformation and doing a lot of things over the course of time. But how do we meet how do we meet family at their point of need right now? Because if PG&E is shut off right now, they need help today, not two weeks, right? So it's it's those type of ideas and that sense of urgency that we want to create around this work, right? It, it's it's making it really granular. And, and, I'll, and I got to tell you, that's what makes this type of a plan so difficult to even articulate and talk about because there is so much that needs to happen, you know, uh, under a framework, right? It's easy to kind of throw darts at it from a framework standpoint, mm -hmm. but when you, when you unpack this and you really take a look at what is this, pan, this, this plan actually seeking to achieve? And in a nutshell, what it is, is it's, it's, it's seeking to basically dismantle the... The, the really the hooks of poverty within a neighborhood uh, and replacing it with opportunity pathways that will take time to construct because it's not going to get constructed overnight either. And then the discipline and the priority of how we invest in young people and their families, right? And what this does is it, it, th this plan provides that framework. And yes, it does start very aspirational because I'll tell you what, we were hard pressed to look and we looked at just about every document in the city and and you know what sadly we had no aspirational vision for our young people mm -hmm. so what this does is this basically says yes it starts aspirationally and it says hey er every young person needs to have a future every every young person needs to get access to silicon valley for many on east side silicon valley could easily be yep. two thousand miles away because they there's no direct pathway um, having said that, I, I, I want to, uh, and, and is this, is this side, uh, can you put this document up real quick, the, uh, the slide, because I want to, I want to, I think it's important to just point you to this framework. It's the, it's the one I gave you, the, the last one. Yeah. Because I think it'll, it'll address a lot of the questions and concerns, both uh, from, from public comment as well as some of the questions that we've got here um, around how, how we see uh, us kind of rolling this out, right? So, so first and foremost, what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, uh, develop a, a framework, a pathway, which would be the conduit. It's one thing for us to say, hey, we got to create opportunity pathways. That's the easiest thing to say. And yes, we got to involve youth. Easy to say that. Yes, we got to do. Uh, but, but how do we do this work? And so the way we've set this up is first we wanted to start with an overarching vision. We want to foster a future where every child and youth in San Jose blossoms into healthy, resilient, self-sufficient adults. Uh, they're enriched with abundant opportunities to live, work, play, dream, and prosper within this landscape, right? Not, not have to move out uh, because they can't afford it. And then there's the unifying purpose. And I think that's really important, this piece here. And this unifying purpose really came from 
multiple meetings with different stakeholders around, okay, at the end of the day, how do we define, how do we call out what we want to do for young people? And this is where we speak to the cradle uh, to career piece. Mm -hmm. And that's creating and expanding opportunity pathways and supports from cradle to career that develop 21st century skills and lead to better health outcomes, sustainable employment, and a competitive living wage for San Jose children, youth, and young adults, birth through ages 24, particularly for those most vulnerable. So we're saying, yes, this will be a citywide approach, but our priority is gonna be the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we say, what values need to drive this work? And that's accessibility and inclusion for all youth, cross-sector collaboration, investment, and accountability. And those are, those are three very loaded, you know, um, you know w words there, right? And then of course, equity, outcomes and results driven, and then youth and community voice driven. This, we have to invert the strategy. This, we can't do the, well, we're the city, here's what we provide for you. We're the county, here's what we provide you. We have to invert that and say, this is the community we're serving, how do we serve you, right? So we're inverting that, that paradigm. And then these are the strategic priority areas. First and foremost, early learning and childcare. So the outcome, if you, if you look down there, down beneath, it's every young person, especially in vulnerable communities, it gets into kindergarten ready to learn. They're, they're ready to learn. Um, you know, the, the next one I would point to is learning and empowerment, right? That, that, that targets the middle school and high school and making sure that they, they are achieving at grade level, that, they're, that they graduate from high school ready for that next move, whether it's college, the trades, anything else, right? Uh, and then what we also heard from folks is health and mental wellness, right? It wasn't enough to just do well in school. Mm -hmm. It wasn't enough to just, yeah, I could read better. Yes, I have access to a computer. It's, it's, it's the whole health and mental wellness. So many of our young kids haven't even seen a dentist in their age five, age six. Um, so there, there's that whole piece. And then, and then, of course, there's the housing access and security that we just talked about. And then there's the meaningful and sustaining jobs, right? It's okay, let's do all this work. And then at the end of that, there needs, and you've said this oftentimes, uh, council member, there needs to be a job waiting for them on the other side of all this work. It can't just be, I'm doing all this work and then you, know, you wanna mm -hmm. pay me minimum wage. So meaningful and sustaining jobs. And then all that being done in a safe, clean and connected community, not a community that's torn apart, not a community that is blighted, not a community that has, has substandard streets and lighting and everything else, but a community that is safe, clean, and connected. And the connected is not just the infrastructure, the connected is people connected to one another, right? Um, and then the last one is systems transformation. And this gets to what Councilmember Torres was getting at. This is where we take a look at the whole system where we say, look, we the city are one part of the puzzle, but it's also the county, it's nonprofits, it's the faith uh, communities, it's the private sector. It's, it's, uh, it's all these, uh, it's, it's everybody in the safety net working together, not just driving our own personal organizational agendas, but working to best serve children, youth, and families that we're serving, right? If we do all that, then the next, those are the expected outcomes you can, you, you can see, and I won't read all those, for, uh, of course, for lack of time. But, so this is a framework. So then how, does, how do we put this into action? There's two tracks. Starting first with our own house here at the city. What, we, what we're looking at is we're taking every single children and youth program and we're mapping it to this vision. We're saying, okay, uh, every, every PRNS program, every library program, how do we map to making sure that we're supporting kids if they're in that age group to be learning ready by kindergarten, to, to make sure that they're uh, meeting their, uh, their A through G requirements, um, our, our work to future, how do we coordinate that into this? Uh, so we start with our own in-house uh, in, in mapping every one of those programs to this vision and purpose. And then secondly, it's a, more of a collective action approach, which is, okay, now how do we connect those programs to the rest of the safety net that's out there, to the SOMOSs, to the FMCIs, to, to the churches, to, the, you know, the, to all the, the San Jose best grantees, and do it in a way where we move away from, okay, here's my program and here's what I do, and shift it more to how do we connect the dots. Some people say, hey, you guys are trying to boil the ocean. I, I, I kind of say, no, we're trying to connect the dots in the ocean, right? Because if we don't connect those things, people fall to the, fall to the cracks, right? 
So this is the framework that we're trying to achieve. We also are the first to say, this isn't the panacea. This isn't going to completely disrupt the poverty. This isn't going to completely, but what this is going to do is it's going to prioritize young people and their families in our city like it has never been done before. Uh, and so that, that's kind of the thinking. But I will, I will tell you, we have been struggling with landing this plane because we got so many people involved and there's so many opinions and there's so many, but, but at some point we got to just, you know, call the question and say, let's just start the work and then we'll course correct as we go. So uh, hopefully that was helpful. No, thank, thank you, Angel. Really appreciate that in-depth um, overview. Just got a few more questions. Sorry about not trying to filibuster the meeting. Um, but you mentioned something that's very, uh, that I'm very hyper-focused on, which is meaningful and sustainable jobs. Um, because I believe, as I mentioned, I think it was this week uh, earlier, that nothing stops a bullet or a crime like a job. In other major cities, workforce development boards engage in key collaborations with major employers to ensure their participants are afforded access to centers um, and then a pipeline to those jobs. Uh, how are we supporting meaningful employers to agree to hire uh, um, our employees via our workforce development programs. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that because this is one that I've been uh, directly involved with. So, so first, uh, I inside, uh, first inside the organization, we're, we're really honing in on our work to future opportunities, right? And, and there's and kind of streamlining that. But the other thing that we're doing is similar to the way we're handling philanthropy is we are is, is we are reaching out to the private sector, both small and tech, uh, right? Uh, and, and we're convening, and we're identifying leadership from those sectors to basically make the, the same pitch to them to say, okay, look, th these are the pipelines that we're building here on this side uh, with young people and their families. Then on the other side, how does the receiving end look? And that I would put in the category of one of the other next steps that we need to do as part of this work. Because I would say that, that that's probably the most underdeveloped part of this whole strategy and probably one of the most difficult because what, as we've reached out to them, what they've said is, hey, we're very interested in the idea. Come back when you have a plan to do this and then we could talk investment. So what we've done is we're going to work this plan and then now we're going to go back and call the question and say, okay, look, here's the, here are the pipelines. Now what, what can you bring to the table? So that's, that's one of the next steps. It would be very good to, you know, identify, I'm sure that the Workforce Development Board at Work to Future can identify workforce data and the need, the highest needs of our employers, um, uh, and then identify certificate programs at community colleges or at Workforce Work to Future, um, and then work with our employers to build an on-ramp to those jobs directly, because I'll be honest with you, the PayPals, the Googles, you know, the Ebays, a lot of times they don't see our community colleges or you know workforce development boards um, as as lucrative pipelines to careers, but they are, and th that's where our kids are. That's where our kids are. Um, many of them don't even make it to uh, um, to the uh, four-year institutions. So if we are going to actually move the needle on um, on hiring, uh, we need to change employer hiring practices here in, in the valley, um, and then stand up pipelines that actually meet the needs of, of local employers. Well, thank you. Um, I got more questions, but I'll, 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 we could follow up with a, a set, another meeting. So um, yeah, let's move forward and call the vote. All right, that was unanimous. So uh, we are now going to item D3, regulating oversized vehicles citywide. Um, I do not believe there is a presentation, but staff is available for questions. Um, can we open it up for public comment? We have one card that was submitted. Jordan Maldo, make your way down to the podium. You will have two minutes to speak. Thank you. Jordan Moldau, District 3. Um, so I was listening to this same discussion at the council meeting last Tuesday, um, and I was pretty disappointed with a lot of what I heard. Um, I feel like Council Member Botcher was the only one who was really making sense to me personally. Um, you know, if you have issues with 
certain crimes, if they're so obvious, they're happening all the time that everyone notices them every day, then it should be possible to do something about those specific crimes. The proposal that you're putting forward is also going to require time and money, so why not put the time and money towards addressing the actual crimes rather than pushing everyone just to a different part of the city. Um, I was also very disappointed with what I heard about how the process is going to unfold. So if I heard correctly, the Muni Code prevents you from actually just going ahead and doing what you want to do, which is to um, make it so that certain size vehicles aren't allowed to park in certain places. Um, I heard you guys say that you have to justify that first via a study that shows that uh, that those vehicles are posing a danger to pedestrians and bicyclists. So I feel like that puts you guys in a really weird position where if you do your study and you find out, oh, it's perfectly safe for bicyclists and pedestrians, then you're not going to get what you want anyway. Um, and it also feels to me like it creates this perverse incentive where you would kind of want it to be unsafe for cyclists and pedestrians in order to be able to justify moving the vehicles. Um, so I'm not particularly happy to hear uh, bicyclists and pedestrian safety being used as the excuse to do the action that you want to do. Um, and you know, I also feel like if you are concerned about cyclist safety, do something about bike lanes that are in door zones. You know, ban parking next to bike lanes or something. Thank you. Thank you. Back to the committee. Thank you so much. Um, let me get out of here. All right, Council Member Vianduan. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, staff, for your hard work on uh, this pilot. I understand that this is, has not been a, an easy lift and one that will likely keep us engaging in discussion until its finality. We as a city are working together to resolve a true crisis. We are and will continue to look at every viable option available to us. And I look forward to putting it, that work with my fellow council colleagues. I believe that with this proposal, we are still very much in the weeds. There's so much conversation and discovery left to do that as we move forward. Well, I have no doubt that we will find some type of solution and ways to, to resolve. I want to ensure that our industrial area are not left vulnerable to shouldering the brunt of the weight should this move forward. For this reason, I find it's imperative that staff continue to hold briefing with council members and craft these sites with our input and approval. Additionally, we should strive to provide as much outreach as we can to ensure that the public and anyone potentially affect, affected or is able to voice their concern and shape their outcome. As you know, Sunrun have left the city of San Jose that cost many, many jobs. Therma Company have put out over $600,000 in their own money to, to fight the unhoused resident and provide security, uh, and many other companies around there trying to protect their employees. And with the memorandum that I have here in front of me, and, and I, I believe that you have it too as well, one, we accept the staff report with no action associated. Two, ensure that a pilot, if a pilot is to be considered, it will not have any movements until after consulting the relevant, the, the relevant council office with clear expectation of location. And only proceeding if the respective council member agreed to it. Addendum A to number two, ensure robust community outreach 
of impacted area in English, Spanish, and Vietnamese. Three, ensure that there is no strict limitation to industrial zone when considering areas for a pilot. And I believe my staff have reached out and discussed this pretty thoroughly with, with your staff. Am I correct on that? That's correct. And with this memorandum, I think we all come to a, an agreement that is, is, is a good memorandum that we can live with. Councilmember, I think that's right. I think the one thing to know is there are some communities where um, there is a population, on the language issue, we want to make sure that uh, what we typically do when we're doing that robust outreach is uh, we'll scan the community using some internal sources to find out um, some communities, they're very heavily uh, Vietnamese, that's the sec second largest language, and other communities, the largest language uh, might be something else in San Jose. So I would just say maybe just having the flexibility as we go forward to find out what the, the need in that given district is, if that makes sense to you. Absolutely. I, I, I appreciate that. That's a, that's a good point. So with that, I, um, I move to accept my NSE memorandum and cross-reference the item to an appropriate city council meeting date as a consent item. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we need a cross-reference. No, we don't need no, a cross no. Okay, we can take that out. Then I move to accept my uh, memorandum then. Can I second it? Second it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I, I, had a, I had a question for staff. So. Um, so ne the, uh, the next step is to come back to, to, to council, or is the next step to, uh, to study it and come back during the budget process? So I, I think that what happened last week is there was an acceptance of the report, and so there are a couple of things that are just sort of the effort to look at federal property, go and evaluate. That stuff will happen regardless, but there will be no uh, none of these other actions, none of these other things that were put in the report in response to prior council direction from rules will we'll go any, anywhere at the moment. Is it, Depending on what happens with their budget setting and priorities and all of that, you all may subsequently direct action, but, but we won't be going, there won't be effort with, re, with regard to the temporary tow pilot, the pilot that Councilmember Duan was talking about. That stuff won't, it just, there won't be another step, frankly, until you all uh, come forward with direction during the, during the budget process. Great, thank you. All right, seeing no other hands, let's call for the vote. All right, that was unanimous. Um, we have to go back to uh, B1, lived in recreational vehicle survey status report. Um, this item is to be deferred. So can I get someone to move a deferral? M move deferral. Second. All right, see no hands, let's do for the vote. Yeah, that's next. Oh, sorry, I need public comment for that item. Do we have any public comment? There were no cards submitted. Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, you we can't be here anymore. Yeah, yeah. All right, now open forum. There are no cards submitted for open forum. All right, thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs> this guy's gonna. No, I gotta get to it.